Did you know that one in five adults who follow regular physical activity guidelines don't see any improvements in their fitness? Now, I know the average what Science viewer is probably more fit and responds better to training than an average human being. But still, this data shows me that many of you might struggle to show any good improvement in cardiorespiratory fitness, even when you are doing a lot of conditioning. In this video, I want to show you a super cool, well thought out study that found a way to make everyone fit, even those who initially did not respond to training. I will also share some key principles that you can apply to make your own training more effective. All right, let's dive into it. Hi everyone, I'm Gomar. I'm a senior scientist at ETH Zurich, based in Switzerland. And for the last decade or so, I studied and taught different aspects of exercise physiology, and now I want to bring some of that science back to you guys. So this concept of people who do not respond to exercise training, where does it actually stem from? It stems from a decade-old study, one of the coolest studies I think ever done in exercise science. It's called the Family Heritage Study. And what did they do? They trained a large cohort of people who were genetically related. So they were from the same families and they trained them for 20 weeks in the lab on a bicycle, on a bike erg, in a progressive overload manner. It was continuous training. Back in the day, they didn't know uh, what HIT training was, so they didn't do any HIT training. And what did they see? Quite interestingly, if you look at the view to max, the gain in view to max, which is, let's say, the, the gold standard of uh, physical fitness, you see that some people, for example, on the right, gained a lot of view to max, like one liter of oxygen per uh, minute, they could actually take up more after this amount of training, like of this, this large amount of training. But some people, and that's the key, did not gain any fitness, right? They even decreased the amount of oxygen they could take up. So there were non-responders or low responders and high responders. And this is really well visible in, let's say, a bell curve. On average, the people gained to 200 to 500 milliliters. So the large, the large percentage of people were obviously sitting in the middle. Some did not gain anything. So less than zero. I mean, these are a certain amount of people. And then also some gained a lot. For example, the elite cyclists or the professional athletes Leads, they would obviously sit more on the right. So since then, researchers and people thought, okay, that's how human variability is. Some people, you can train them as much as you want, they just don't gain any fitness. But then a cool paper came out that, let's say, tried to refute this myth. He thought, or this researcher thought, that's impossible. If you train in a correct way, everyone responds to exercise training. That's at least was his hypothesis. So the title of the paper was refuting the myth of non-response to exercise training. Non-responders do respond to higher doses of training. And this is obviously the key point of this video. So how did he tackle this question of non-responders to exercise? He had a very clever study setup, and that's also why I want to share this study. And that's also why I think it can be valuable for you if you are training a lot of conditioning. So first of all, he had 87 untrained people who were kind of sed sedentary, but they were young and healthy, all right? And then he had some baseline testing. The most important thing was that he tested their VO2, VO2 max, with an incremental test to exhaustion. I've talked a lot about these kind of tests in my previous videos, so if you're not unsure on how to look at this kind of test, please have a look at my previous videos popping up on the screen right now. So baseline testing, the determining of VO2 max and the max amount of wattage they could push aerobically. And then uh, he divided them into five groups. That's important. One group just trained once a week, a second group trained two times a week, three times a week, four times a week, and five times a week, right? So that was these five groups. And those groups trained all six weeks. And the training consisted of different intensities, so also high intensity training, as well as continuous endurance training, alternating between the sessions to make it fun. That's also what's written in the paper for the participants, so do not have too many dropouts, for example. And then he simply tested their view to max again after these six weeks. And then he thought, okay, some people who trained very low volume, like once, two times, maybe three times a week, are not really going to respond in terms of VO2 max to those exercises, to that exercise training. And those people, so the non-responders, he took again after a two-week of washout, they call, so without training, he took again and said, okay, guys, now you have to train two times more. So if you trained once in the previous, in the training one, the first session, you have to train three times. If you trained two times, 
you have to train four times. If you trained three times, you have to train five times, all right? And then you wanted to take those non-responders, initial non-responders, and just increase or up the ante, up the volume. All right, so let's look at the data. What you see here is the maximal wattage, so the maximum power they can push during an incremental test to exhaustion. And you see that the people who trained only once in this first six weeks of training, they gained basically almost no fitness and 70% of them were non-responders, obviously because they trained very low volume. And then you see it nicely goes up, two times a little bit better, three times a bit better, and then four and five times everyone responded. So those people, the four and the five group, were completely, let's say, excluded from the study. He took then the people that did not respond, so 70% of group one, 40% of group two, and 30% of group three, it took those and trained them again for six weeks, but additional volume, two times more. And here you beautifully see that, you see the line here, that everyone responded to this extra volume of training. So how do you interpret this data? This is actually a very nice within subject design, where on the left side, it's always the data in maximal aerobic power or from maximal aerobic power after six weeks of training, after the initial six weeks of training. And the, by design, these people did not increase or they were the non-responders. But then on the right side, you see the nice increase in maximal aerobic power for everyone when they did additionally two more training sessions for six weeks. All right, so this clearly shows that if you just increase the amount of training, so literally the training sessions per week, everyone out of these 87 people, not one exception, increased their VO2 max or the maximal aerobic power. And another note, this was mostly related to an increase in total red blood mass, which is one of the major effects of exercise training, obviously. So the question is, okay, nice paper, but what does this mean for you? If you are someone who is doing, for example, functional fitness, because I know most of the people watching these videos are doing functional fitness, and you want to increase your aerobic conditioning, one of the first things definitely you have to do is test yourself throughout the year. So you don't know about your aerobic conditioning if you just don't test yourself. If you only do CrossFit workouts, you don't really understand or you don't really know your pure aerobic conditioning. So I would, for example, do an FTP test. I have uh, explained such tests in a previous video. You can always uh, watch that or re-watch that. You can do a VO2 max test in a lab. You can do a time trial, for example, running or a, a 10K row or something like that. Something long and aerobic. Do this every... 10 weeks every 12 weeks for sure. Important, you also have to monitor your training volume because if you don't know how much actual training you are doing, being it in functional fitness, being it in pure conditioning, you obviously are just looking in the blind and you don't know what you are improving. So a good way to do this is using the TRIMP method. That's also a, a method that we use in our programming where you simply multiply the training time times the RPE or the session RPE on how hard this training was. For example, I did uh, a zone two session just before making this video. Uh, I ran uh, 60 minutes and this was RPE three. So this would be a trim of 180. All right. And then you can do also a CrossFit session, which would be shorter, but much higher intensity and so on and so forth. So this is also how we use trim in our training programs. And then if you are seeing that there's some kind of stagnation or you're not really improving in your time trials, in your conditioning pieces, in your uh, running pieces and so on, you have to up the volume quite dramatically, 10 to 15% in a progressive overload manner. And this, again, you cannot know if you have no uh, idea about your total training volume. And to do that, Certainly for functional athletes who are doing a lot of high rocks uh, or are doing quite some uh, CrossFit and they want to improve their conditioning, we suggest working with block periods where you focus on one area predominantly while obviously maintaining the rest. And that's also, again, how we program. For example, in the season leading up to the Open, we have a piece where we focus predominantly on aerobic conditioning that's mostly in the summer and just before the summer where you have 12 weeks of aerobic conditioning we also do some crossfit workouts but most of it will be aerobic conditioning and then from there we use that base to do also more functional fitness under high intensity and also strength power and gymnastics the same for high rocks, for example where you divide the season 
based on what you want to achieve in a competition where you do block prioritization of low intensity, long endurance, baseline aerobic conditioning, and then you build up doing more intense work when, for example, uh, the high rocks season is entering the final stages. All right. So that's a little bit on how you have to see it. If you're interested in checking out our programs where we quite deliberately try to apply these uh, principles ourselves, you can always scan the QR code that is popping up right now or click simply the first link in the description. We can have a look at our uh, free trials or seven day free trials. All right. That was already it from me today. If you're struggling with conditioning, monitor your training load and up the training volume in a block periodized way. That is the way to go to improve your overall conditioning while still maintaining functional fitness. If you got value out of this video, please don't forget to like and also subscribe to the channel. That was it from my part. See you in the next one. Ciao.